of scripture and the mysteries of time, and especially the mystery of who you are. I ask tonight that you would help us to focus in on what we do know and understand of you, even though it's interesting to explore what we don't. Remind us that you have given us sufficient knowledge and evidence to embrace you fully in your desire to have a relationship with us. Amen. Right, the first thing I'm going to do, even though she isn't here, is I'm going to follow up on uh, Linda Buck's question uh, about um, in the, uh, kind of how cru so so we will deal with God as I mean Jesus' father. So I'll, I'll follow up on that creation question of um, how did the world populate? If you take that passage literally from Genesis two, how did the world populate itself based on Adam and Eve, and then Cain, Abel, and Seth? So Linda had said two things. Uh, she had researched and found that in Genesis 5, Adam and Eve had daughters. Um, and she had raised the notion of, well, was it possible that God okayed incest at that time and hence the world was populated? So I went back with those facts and just kind of looked through some of the sequence of events. So I'm not asking you to look it up, but if you want to do this later, most of this is out of Genesis uh, four and five. Um, so Cain is born, born first to Adam and Eve. This is the chronology. And then Abel is born to Adam and Eve. Cain kills Abel. And in Genesis 4.14, Cain is then afraid of anyone who will find him and do him in because he's killed his brother. Why would he be afraid of anyone? I mean, at this stage, we've got Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve. That's it. So there must have been other people around because Cain was obviously afraid of being done in. So God gives Cain a mark to protect him. Um, and God promises that if anyone kills him, he will avenge, avenge them. So there must be other people on the earth at this stage. Seth is not yet born. But after this, after Cain has killed Abel and Cain asks for protection from other people who are obviously clearly existing, we are told that Cain gets married. Therefore, there's, there's, other, people. there's other people. I mean, there's another woman around who Cain marries. Um, and then in Genesis 4.17, it says Cain builds a city. Why would Cain build a city? Unless there are other people around. So, um, again, I don't want to kind of revisit last week in fullness, but the Genesis 1 creation story makes a lot more sense to me. That God created human beings all in one occasion, created as mankind and womankind. And the story of Adam and Eve is a story to illustrate sin more than it is a story about creation. Even though creation is listed there, the days of creation are in Genesis 1. Uh, the events of creation are in Genesis 2, along with Cain and Abel uh, and Adam and Eve. Um, a little later in Genesis, um, Seth is born to Adam and Eve. And then only after that does it say that Adam and Eve went on to have other sons and daughters. So I don't know if that kind of helps you. Like I said last week, if you if you try and take that story as literal, it, it, it makes it very, very confusing, highly confusing. I don't think the two stories contradict each other. I think they're written with a different purpose. Because again, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the order of creation is different. The name of God is different. Um, that's right. Moses read that is right. Or it's just... A sin that Moses wrote. That's that's a controversy. So it's assumed that Moses wrote, without getting to make the sound like seminary class. There is evidence that the first five books of the Bible were written by uh, four different schools of thought: the Elohists, the Yahwists, the Deuteronomists, and the priests. Because, like, so, for instance, the story of 
creation. You've got two stories. God is called Elohim in the one and Yahweh in the other. Why would that be? I mean, it, it would seem like Moses may have collated the stories or a, a, it was common in Old Testament times for people to collate stories together and then put them under the name of an author. So we may say, well, Moses literally wrote it. A school of folk who followed Moses may have put it together and attributed it to Moses. That was legit in those days. Seems like plagiarism in our days. It was legit in those days. So I don't want to get too far down the road in that. They're, they're two flood stories. Story of Noah, there's two flood stories, if you read them carefully. Um, and again, you, you've got these slight variances. So tradition says Moses, analyzing the scriptures a little bit more closely, says there may be more going on than that. So that's just a, 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 a word of thought. Um, let me lastly answer Linda's question of, could God have allowed incest at that time and then condemned it later? So in, you find in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God condemns incest. It's possible, but I still think that's just weird. So you learn something new every day, right? So when I was looking at this, to this topic, I didn't realize that Abraham and Sarah were brother and sister. Did you know that? If you go into Genesis 20, Abraham admits that Sarah is his sister. Now, it's his sister through his, they have a common father, not a common mother. Maybe it's the other way around. So technically it's a half sister, but I'm sorry, that's still your sister. So, and God doesn't condemn that. Weird? I thought he just told him that that was his sister. He told me it wasn't his wife, but it was his sister. Sister, right. right. He got in trouble with the Lord. <laughs> yeah, well, he got in trouble by kind of farming her out for one of the better yeah. words. Um, well, if he lied again, then God certainly didn't condemn that. So which one is true? Did Abraham make it up or was that, that the case? So I don't know. Again, all of these problems come if you see that as a literal story, chronologically ordered versus is this a story that tells us that God has created and that through human beings, through our defiance, sin came about. I've got to leave that question with you. I can present both sides of the story, but the decision as to how you want to take that is yours. And there's different thoughts in Christian studies on that. So, like I said earlier, I tend to pick the side of it's a truth that's being communicated, not the literal words of God that was written down, but it's for your, your decision. So, any thoughts or questions on that one before we move on? Mm. No, we're all good. Mm. All right. So, let's switch gears. Mm. Tonight's question is this. Mm. Questions. How is it a genealogy shows Jesus' ancestry through King David and the patriarch Abraham? How can this be if Jesus is the Son of God? So, what I want to do is do a broader umbrella first and then answer that underneath the umbrella. So the umbrella, broader umbrella that I'm going to address is God is a triune God. And then we'll speak about how is Jesus both human and God. All right? We good on that? Okay. So what I need you to do is let's go to um, let us go to Genesis 1.26. If somebody could read Genesis 1.26 out aloud, loud, that would be awesome. Uh, we're going to take some different tangents of Genesis 1 verse 26. <clears throat> then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 
Yeah, just so we're good. Thank you. So this question was asked last week. Who's us? So then God said, let us make mankind in our image. That's the reference to where God creates male and female as in mankind and womankind. What I want to focus on tonight is this word us. Who is the us? And look at some different possibilities as to who that may be. Most Christians would believe and say, as, and I, I would certainly support this, that that's a reference that us make is to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here's how we get there. Uh, somebody read Genesis 1, verse 1 through 2, please. Somebody look up John 1, 13 and 1, 3 in the meantime, and somebody look up Malachi 2, 10 and 1 Corinthians 8, 6 in the meantime. <clears throat> Okay, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Thank you. So what I want to pull from that is the Spirit is present in creation. <clears throat> Right? The Spirit is hovering over the face of the water. The Spirit is pretty. The Holy Spirit is pretty. Uh, John 1 3. Anybody? Thank you, Susan. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that, is, that has been made. Okay. So I need to give that a bit of context. John 1 speaks about the word. And in speaking about that word, he's speaking about Jesus Christ. It says, nothing came into being without him. All things were made through him. Jesus. Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. Thank you, babe. Don't we all have the same father? Didn't the same God create us all? Then why do we break our promises to one another? And why do we despise the covenant that God made with our ancestors? Okay. Didn't our Father make us all? All right, and just to reinforce that, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Okay, yes, for in us there is one God, the Father, and then for all things. And we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ, through him all are all things, and through him we live. Okay. Through him are all things. All things are in existence because of him, referring to God as Father. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's who we understand is present when it says, let us make them in our image, them referring to humanity. Okay, everybody clear on that, on that picture? Anybody want to ask a question about that? Okay, so we want to have this clear picture here. What I want to teach you about, talk to you about, though, um, is the possibility that maybe us refers to someone else. So the Jews, for instance, obviously don't believe that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were present at creation because Jesus is yet to arrive. Okay? Um, so in Genesis 1.26, there's two possibilities that are suggested. Maybe God is speaking to the heavenly realm. God saying to the angels and all other creatures in heaven, let us. But there's a problem with that, a major problem. Because angels can't create. Let us make, let us create human beings. So that's the first thing. In our image is what Genesis 1.26 says. We are not created in, in, in images of angels. The Bible is very clear. Angels are separately created species than humans. Just like animals are separately created species. Well, humans are animals. Let's say um, cows are, are separately created than us. That there are different species. Angels are spiritual beings. They are differently created than humans, which is why technically it's inaccurate to say when somebody goes to heaven, they become an angel. But we don't. We become perfect human beings, better than an angel. 
I don't want to be a second class citizen in heaven. I don't know about you. <laughs> I, I want God to fulfill his promise that we would be greater than angels when we get to heaven. So, so there's a major problem with that in saying God is addressing the heavenly realm. Um, because let us make falls apart and in our image falls apart. All right, so that's that's one school thought. The other one is maybe God was speaking to the other gods. There's some passages that speak about that. So if somebody can look up Deuteronomy 10 verse 17, somebody look up Psalm 95 verse 3, and then 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Those three passages are what we're going to look at. Deuteronomy 10, 17, Psalm 95 verse 3, and then we'll say, well, there's a caveat to that, and that's in 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. The Lord your God is... Which one are you reading? The first one. The first one, okay. The Lord your God is supreme over all gods and over all powers. He is great and mighty, and he is to be feared. He does not show partiality. He does not accept bribes. Okay. So if you look at that text, it says the Lord your God with a capital G is supreme over all gods with a little g. Psalm 95.3. Somebody have that for us? Psalm 95 verse 3. Who's going to be first? Okay. We, we have a winner. <laughs> For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. Oh. So the Lord God, right? Capital G is the great king and is above oh, all little G. little G gods. All right. So some would say, okay, this is God speaking in at their time. Because a lot of people then, even in the pre- um, um, how should I call this? The, the, the pre-12 tribes of Israel stage, uh, God was working with other gods. Not working with, competing with. I guess is a better, better iteration of it. Um, so it was like God was admitting, okay, you have your gods. But God always said, your gods really are fake. They're not real. This is just a recognition that before Christianity came along, people were worshiping other gods, the sun god, the moon god. Correct. Correct. It's a recognition of them worshiping, but God saying, but your gods aren't real. So who was it that tested out? Who had the competition of the, the, the setting the wood on fire when it was wet? Or black? Was, it a, was it a fleece? Uh, Come on, my biblical scholars, who, who was that, that? That he said, well, I'll bring along Baal, and I'll show you that Baal is greater than Yahweh. Somebody look that up while we're finishing this off. Okay, somebody read 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Karen. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, whom, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come, came and through whom we live. All right, so there's that passage saying so-called gods. So there's a recognition that other people worship gods, but God constantly reminds Israel, they'll do nothing for you because they've got nothing to offer. All right? Does that make sense, Terry? It's in 1 Kings 18, 17 through 24, and 28 through 39 is the showdown. Okay. So, and then who is the showdown between? Uh, Ahab, Ahab and Elijah. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Ahab, who brings them on ball, and Elisha, who says... Our Lord is the one who's the real Lord. We'll put it to the test and God proves it. Okay, any thoughts or comments on that? So, again, you've got the problem. 
If God is speaking to the other gods, then you've got the problem when it says, let us make, because God didn't contrive with other gods to make us as humans. And we are not made in the image of other gods. We are not made in the image of Baal. We are made in the image of Yahweh. So you, you land up with the same problem, whether you think, whether this text is explained away by saying us means God speaking to the heavenly realm or us is God speaking to the other gods, they fall flat. So that's why I believe that us is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and there's other scripture passages that certainly support that. Are we good? Okay, does that make things a little clearer in terms of, okay, all right. So, God is a trinity. Um, some people have said there's a third way you can explain this away. That in the story of Genesis 1.26, where God is called Elohim, the Hebrew word Elohim is plural. It's the all one powerful God, is what it literally translates to. Um, but in the Genesis uh, 2 passage where God makes Adam and Eve, God is called Yahweh, and there's no reference to God as, you know, a, a plural form. But that, that's not correct, because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, God says, uh, well, well, I'll have somebody read it. Genesis 3, 22. Genesis 3, 22. <clears throat> Okay, Genesis 3.22. And the Lord said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He okay. must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Right. So the reference to one of us, one of us in the, in the, in the, in the Trinity. Um, so whichever creation story you take, God is referred to as a triune God in, in each of those stories. So I... I I think there's a strong case for the presence of the Trinity first being mentioned um, at creation and then reinforced throughout Scripture. All right. Um, so let's move on to a slightly different not thought, but perhaps um, The reinforcement of the Trinity. So, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. If somebody could look up Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 for us and read it out loud. You got a question? Yeah. Fire away. Okay, in Genesis 1, go back to 126. Yes. It says, Now we'll make human beings that will be like us and resemble us. And if you take that for what it says and then assume that he is talking about the, the Trinity, how does that equate to us? How will we resemble the Trinity? Okay, so the, the, the another way to ask the question is how are we created in God's image? Well, God doesn't have a physical image except for when he became human as Jesus Christ. But God became human. Humans weren't created as God. So our, our, in the image we have of God is not a physical one. Paul says when we are resurrected, we are given new bodies. So don't worry about this one. It's not going to hinder you afterwards. You'll be given a spiritual body. And you will re remain your spirit. You will retain your, your spirit, as it were. Um, so, so the image... That would be our Holy Spirit likeness? Yeah, because our spirit com combines with God's spirit, Scripture says, for us to have fellowship with God. So we are like God in the sense that we are spiritual beings. That's what sets us apart from any other animal. Some animals have souls, but we are spiritual beings primarily, not physical beings. 
So we are created in God's image in that we are spiritual beings. And we have fellowship with God unlike any other thing in creation. And even though the trees of the fields will clap their hands, that's not a literal translation from the Psalms. The psalmist is trying to say even creation adores God, but they don't adore God like we do. In what way will we be like God? Um, well, in heaven we'll be like God in the sense that we'll be we'll be all loving. We will know uh, uh, God's fullness in 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 our own lives. Just two things that I can think of. Is that okay? All right. Um, so we we Deuteronomy six verse four. Thank you. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So that's interesting. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. What's he possibly referring to? Hint, we've already been speaking about it. Trinity. Right. I mean, what other explanation is there to that passage? The Lord our God is one. All right, so just to reinforce the belief that the Trinity is not just a New Testament thing. Trinity has been in existence through creation, now here in the book of Deuteronomy. All right? Um, another reference to the Trinity. This is New Testament. If we can look at Matthew um, 3, verse 16 through 17. Somebody read Matthew 3, 16 through 17. Three sixteen through seventy. Jesus replied, "Is that one one sixteen through seventy? Okay. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill our righteousness." That's John the Baptist speaking, right? Then and, John consented. Yes. Right, and then what? And then what happens? What's verse sixteen and seventeen? As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, "This is my Son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased." You see those three in the in the story of Jesus' baptism. Jesus is baptized, and heaven is opened, and he sees the Spirit. And then a voice says to him, you are my son. My son. All, all three uh, uh, persons of the Trinity present in Jesus' baptism. So there's plenty of other references in the Bible to the Trinity, but I've tried to take three, three of them um, creation and God saying to Israel, you really need to hear us. The Lord your God is one. And then in Jesus' baptism, those are kind of some really strong moments uh, in terms of that. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all one. That's a difficult thing to explain that they three persons, but one God. If you haven't heard the uh, the analysis of water or H2O, is the one that makes more sense to me that H2O can be steam, it can be liquid water, or it can be ice. And that there is a scientific temperature where there is a temperature where scientifically they coexist as liquid, steam, and ice together. It's called the, the, the triple point. So that's to me is the greatest analogy. A lot of people used other things like egg, you know, the shell, the yolk. Uh, so the shell, the white, and the yolk. But the water thing is like, that's, that's really cool. That there are three separate forms. You experience ice very, very different than them do steam. If you don't think so, please don't try it. But they really are different. Uh, so the concept of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is strong throughout Scripture. We all good on that? All right. So, what we're going to do now, 
is use that umbrella and we're going to look at, at Jesus. When was Jesus born? Great question. When was Jesus born? December 25th. <laughs> December 25th. <laughs> well, according to that, he's always been there. Ah, yes. Jesus has always been in existence, according to this. Because he's God. Some of the creation of Jesus made the creation. Janet, read what you were reading. Um, I was just speaking. Oh, you're just speaking? That's the first You were quoting John 1, right. John 1, yeah. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus and God, same, same character. But Jesus is born in physical form. Initially, they thought the year zero, but they miscalculated that. We think it's probably somewhere between 4 and 6 BC. Others would say between 2 and 4 BC, but somewhere in that, somewhere in that era. But in any case, there was a point at which Jesus was born in human flesh. So how then do we explain that this Jesus, who's been here forever, is born as a human? All right. So to do this, what I'd like to do is focus on two, two names that are given to Jesus in the Bible. There are lots of names given to Jesus in the Bible. There are lots. But the two that I want to focus on tonight... Was it like different groups of people that gave him these different names? Or how did they come about that there were so many names? Uh, because they all mean they all meant something like uh, you know Jesus is the Lamb, you know that's that's a, a, a prophecy. So sometimes we understand Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is a prophecy. So some of those names came from Old Testament references to the Messiah. Some came from how Jesus referred to himself. So here are two things that Jesus calls himself. I am son of man. And son of man, right. Well, Jesus refers to himself in the human form in both of those terms. But, but there are times, though, that when people ask him who he is, he would say, I am. Capital A M. Right. Referring back to Joe, uh, uh, God's word to, to Moses when he said, how do I introduce you to Pharaoh, God? And God just said, tell him I am. Smart attic answer, but very <laughs> profound, right? So Jesus also refers to himself as the I am. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. So, Son of God and Son of Man. He said relative to I am God, I am the Spirit, I am. Yeah, I'm the bread of life, I am John. John. The, 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 trial, the, the three. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yes. I am Amen. singular. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I, I like that too. I am singular. So, yes, thank you. Never thought of it that way. I am as in I, I claim the same status that God claims. I am. Yeah. So, these terms are used pretty equally throughout the New Testament. The amount of times that they are used. Now, some people have a struggle with this. I enjoy the mystical side of God. I like the fact that there's, there's lots of God that I simply cannot explain. Because that's, that, for me, is the sense of all. If God was fully explainable, I don't think God would be God anymore. You know, he'd just be awesome. But I'm not sure he would be God. But the mystery of, the, of our faith, or the mystery that is our faith, encompasses this question. However, some have um, said this is, this is so unintelligible that they've decided that Jesus isn't God. So I'm going to give you a handout as an example to that. You guys can pass that around there. 
All right, so what these, what, what you have in front of you is a photocopy of two different Bibles. This is a new international version, which is on your left side of the page. And the one on the right-hand side page is the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Anybody know who uses the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures? Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness. What I want you to do is look at John chapter 1, verse 1, in both. Again, left-hand side, New International Version. Right-hand side, the New World Translation of the Holy Scripture. For a moment, just look at John 1, verse 1, in each one, and tell me what you notice. Give it a second, and then I'll come to you, Michael. Just let, let everybody read. <laughs> Anybody picking up on the difference of John 1, 1 in the one translation versus the other? Mm -hmm. Okay. Michael, tell us what you, what you see. Well, the New World Translation says a God, so. That Jesus was a God with a small g, right? right. And New International Version, as is the case with the vast majority of other Christian translations, says Jesus. Capital G. Jesus is God. Capital G, not a God. So Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in the Trinity. They do not believe that Jesus is God. It's the same as the Mormons. The Mormons also don't believe that Jesus is God. They believe that Jesus is literally the Son of God. He doesn't have divine attributes. He's a prophet, a great prophet, as the Muslims believe. But then they're not a Christian faith. So um, some folks have just said, can't explain the mystery, so I'll tell you what. Let's just make it easy to understand. We'll print a different version of the Bible. Sorry, I'm being sarcastic, but that's essentially what happened. Everybody got that? Do you see the difference? What word did you say this is? It is the, the New World Translation. That's scary. Just those words. Yes. The New World. You know. Uh-huh. Just out of curiosity, in that New World Translation, are there many other misinterpretations? There, there are other misinterpretations to support this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, um, Just out of curiosity, but there might be way to I didn't know. Um, yeah, there is. Uh, let me see. I'm letting the types and saying. Okay, I've got one other mark here. I'd have to try and look at what it's. Oh, okay. The, it's from Philippians, and we'll look at this tonight. The translation says, Keep this mental attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was existing in God's form. So Philippians, when we look at it, you'll see our translation says, Although he is, he, he is in the... Uh, in, in, in the image of God, I I'm not sure what the exact words are, that he is God, in the nature of God, uh, they say that he existed in this form. So Jesus doesn't exist in a form. Jesus is God. He's not some kind of a replica of God. So they don't believe in the Trinity. They do not believe in the Trinity, and neither do the Mormons. Okay. They do not believe in the Trinity. Is that what you're going to ask? Yes. Yeah. I want to be clear. Yeah. Now, the Mormons will say that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that he died for your sins. But if you push them, they will not agree with the statement that Jesus is fully human and fully God. They will say he's fully human. And they'll stop there. But all of the wording, if you read through their documents and their pamphlets that they put out to welcome people in their church, they certainly make it look like Jesus is God. But when you go get into their doctrine, they do not believe that. Right. So we believe that he is. So what I'm going to do is give you some examples so we can look these up. Um, Son of God. John chapter 10, verse 3. Somebody look that up. And someone else look up John 14 verses 9 through 11. John 10 verse 3. Uh, 30. I'm sorry. My error. 
John 10, verse 30. Yes. And my father are one. I and my father are. I and my father are one. All right. So Jesus is fully God. I and my father are one. Now, I've heard people say to me, well, you know, that can be like a husband and a wife, that they're of one flesh. That's not what one is meaning here. One is one in nature. They are, they are the same nature, the same essence. So it doesn't just mean that Jesus is one way out here on his own. That passage is saying, I and the Father are one. Not just in purpose or in mind, but we are one in nature. All right. John 14, 9 through 11. Okay. Jesus answered, For a long time I have been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe, Philip, that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I have spoken to you, Jesus said to his disciples, do not come from me, the Father who remains in me. He does. The Father who remains in me does his own work. Okay. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If not, believe because of the things I do. Right. So if Jesus had just stopped at that point and said, I am in the Father, then you go, okay, cool. He's got, he's got God in his life. But he says, the Father is in me. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I and the Father are one. Philip, why do you ask who I am? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because we are one. All right? So the Son of God, Jesus being fully divine, comes in this moment. Scriptures for the Son of Man. Is, what is, is there any conflict between that and where the Bible says you can't see God? You can't look at God? Good question. Well... The Bible doesn't necessarily say, it just says you can't see God's face or God's form, right? Except in Jesus. Except in Jesus, because Jesus, you can see God in Jesus because Jesus is in human form. But Jesus as God, there would be nothing to see because God doesn't have a physical form. Am I answering your question? Yes. Does everybody else get that? Jesus is the only one that's physical that we could see. Right, right. That was seen. Yeah. The Holy Spirit and God are not physical beings. Correct. And Jesus is a spiritual being except for this period where he came to the earth. When you see the dove come down in baptism or you see the dove someplace, that's the spirit and that's something physical you can see. So you you're seeing God, but you're seeing God in one of Right, that's great. So that's, yeah, yeah. So, so often the Holy Spirit is described as a dove. Jesus is also described as the dove. Am I right? Let me back that tape up. I'm not sure that he is. Um, but the Holy Spirit is described as a dove. doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's literally a dove. Jesus sees the Holy Spirit as a dove. Well, other people see the dove too. Humans right. see the dove. Right, because, it, well, yeah, a, a humans see the dove, but the Spirit also comes in other forms. So at Pentecost, the humans saw the Holy Spirit as tongues of fire, as tongues of, as tongues of fire. So these, these are just forms in which we can identify God, but that doesn't mean that God is that form. Israel saw God as a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of by day. Pillar of cloud by day. That doesn't mean God's a cloud, right? That's not what that scripture is trying to say. It's trying to say God showed himself in a form, but that doesn't mean that that is the form of God. It's just God showing us. All right, so let's look at four passages where Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. I'm going to go through each of the Gospels. Matthew 8.20. 
Mark 2.10. Luke 9.44, John 3.13. All right, so if we can have maybe four different tables. Do you guys have access? Actually, you do now. <laughs> if you guys can look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. Sherry, and if your table will look at Mark 2.10. Terry, if you look at Luke 9, verse 44. Uh, Susan, if you look at John 3, verse 13. Sorry, I should say Terry or Chandler. You can argue over who's going to read Luke 9, 44. Okay, Matthew 8, 20. Mark chapter 2, verse 10. Luke chapter 9, verse 44. And John chapter 3, verse 13. Let's go... With these guys first. Matthew 8 verse 20. Um, Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark chapter 2 verse 10. Karen. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Okay. So he said to the man. Well. All right. So that it gets, it's Jesus saying. He's speaking about himself. Something. Luke 9, verse 44. Don't forget what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be handed over to the power of human beings. Okay. So that's talking about Jesus being handed over to Pilate. John 3, 13. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. All right. So all of these are referring to Jesus. So Jesus... Is referred to the Son of God. I haven't given you the literal passages for that. If you want to see Jesus referring to himself as the Son of God, just do a search, Son of God. Um, but these are passages that indicate that Jesus is God. These are passages that indicate Jesus is man. How we explain that Jesus can be fully God and fully human at the same time, I can't explain that to you. Part of the mystery of God. I just... Can't explain that to you. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 will sum this up for us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. So what I want you to do is whoever reads this, and those of you who are listening, I want you to look for which parts of this passage refer to God and which part of this passage refers to man. Jesus is a human. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. So I'll just let everybody find that, and then we'll, we'll look at this. All right, somebody read out Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Jesus Christ was humbled. Willing to give up his rights in order to obey God and serve people. Like Christ, we should have. Yeah, you good. You good. Uh, we should have a servant's attitude, serving out of love for God and for others, not out of guilt or fear. Remember, you can choose your attitude. You can approach life expected, expecting to be served, or you can look for opportunities to serve others. And then seven. Luke, I mean Philippians chapter two, verse five through eight. Oh, five through eight. Okay. In the incarnation. Was the act of the pre existent Son of God voluntarily assuming a human body and human nature without cause causing to be God? He became a human being, the man called Jesus. He did not give up his dignity he, he, uh, to become human. But the set, but to, but he set aside the right 
to his glory and power. In submission to the Father's will, Christ limited his power and knowledge. Jesus of Nazareth was subject to place, time, many other human limitations. What made his humanly unique, humanity uh, unique, was his freedom from sin. In his full humanity, Jesus showed us everything about God's character that can be conveyed in human terms. The indication, I'm sorry, the incarnation is explained further in different passages. Okay. So Sharon, what version are you reading from? This is New King James. New King James. Okay. So so I'm gonna try um John, would you mind are you put an NIV there? Okay. Yeah, I believe that is an NIV. Okay. Read, read that version and let's see. I'm not saying that that's wrong, but let's hear it from a different name. Five through eight. Yeah. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself <coughs> nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being <clears throat> found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself uh, by becoming obedient to death, even on the cross. Okay. So tell me from those two passages, how is Jesus God and how is Jesus man? Okay, let me ask this differently. From those two passages, is Jesus God? Yes. Yes. Is Jesus man? Yes. He is fully God. Yes. Right, because it says it's in his nature. <coughs> and he's fully man because he has our limitations. He didn't, Jesus didn't come down with some kind of superpower. He didn't cheat. He, he didn't take on the power of God while he was fully, he was fully human, but he was also fully God. So he's here to teach us how to live and to be servants to others. Right, right. In human form, mm -hmm. but still fully God. Right. Because he surrendered his powers of what it would be to be God. John? So I, I'm sort of stuck because not being real fluent in, in the Bible, but when he was crucified, he called out to God. Yes. So why would God call out to God? Because he was human with human limitations. And his feeling of being separated from God in that moment was very, very human. But what was... I don't understand who he was trying to communicate with. God as Father. He as Son communicating to God as Father. Because he was still human. Because he was still human. Right. Right. Well, I understood that he was human. That, that, this has been a very interesting discussion because I never considered that Jesus was God. I considered that Jesus was human and there was this unknown individual or spirit mm -hmm. that was his father that had propagated him and or created his, caused his creation yeah. and, and moved him on through the process. It's, the, it's in the same way at baptism, you have the reverse thing happening. Why would God as Father say to Jesus, you are my son in whom I am well pleased? It, you've just got the reverse, Jesus on the cross saying, God, my Father, why have you forsaken me? Part of that is the mystery we can't explain, but part of that also says Jesus being fully human had limitations on his understanding of God and his experience of God even though he was aware who he was, because the scriptures had told him so, he, it, it would be unfair to Jesus for, for Jesus to have super spiritual powers as a human being. In these three things, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, occupy the same space and the same time and actually be one thing. God. Yes. Yes. They are three but one. They are three but one. Did that ever happen? 
that they all three are together. Yeah. And and they all had that cognizant moment where they recognized that we are who we are right now, which is one, instead of being three different entities. Yes. You would think at creation they would have been that. At creation, yeah. let, let us make. Yeah. Let us three in one make. So we're running over time. Is that okay? If we take a few minutes here. Also, what about like after after he was risen from the dead in that one movie? Again, it's a movie. I understand that, but it kind of shows that he's going up and God is there, and then it's good. Yeah, you know? yeah. So right. like when he's ascending into heaven, you know, after. Yes, a risk. Yes, so that the ascension, Jesus is now no longer in human form, right? So, and, and Jesus goes to sit at the right hand of the Father, which again doesn't literally mean that in heaven God as Father sits in a chair and Jesus sits in a chair next to him. It's for us to try and understand how, for us to understand God in human terms. So, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each are able to operate in their own unique ways. <coughs> there is a part, though, in which God operates as an entity, and creation is a great example of that, the creation of story, the story of creation. If your mind's going, it should be. This is this is very difficult to grasp <coughs> because it's so way beyond us. So at creation, if you had the ability, <clears throat> you could go to each one of those three entities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you asked them what happened and how it happened, they would all replicate the same. I mean, they were there. They're conscious of all the actions that took place. Right. Yes, yes. It's only when Jesus is a human being that he's not fully conscious as a spiritual being. Just because, as Philippians said, he, he, to be fully human, decided to surrender his powers at the door in being fully human. Even though he performed miracles. Yeah. Right. But <coughs> we can pray and miracles can happen too. So Jesus' miracles, so and Jesus himself <coughs> says, I don't do the miracles as a sign of power. I do them as a sign of compassion. That's what the Pharisees wanted. Jesus, Jesus, do a miracle and prove that you are God. Jesus said, that, that's not what I'm about. That's not why I do miracles. So he, he didn't have this superpower about him at that time. Yes, Jesus had extraordinary faith, for sure. But it's, it's, it's not an achievable faith. Well, he wasn't. Doing the miracle as God, he was doing the miracle as Jesus, Jesus the human, utilizing the powers of God. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Yes, Chandler. I know we're over time, and I just had a quick question. We can talk about it later. <clears throat> Even though we're children of God, we know we're children of God. Is there any scripture that's, that backs up the idea, the thought that we were with God in spirit before and we came here and were born into this world as a like learning experience? And then we'll go back to that. And no, <laughs> no, there isn't. There isn't. There isn't a. There, we weren't pre-existent. Okay. Okay. So God knew when we would be born, and and and, and David says, "God, you 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 were there at the moment I was conceived," which says to me, "I didn't exist in a previous <coughs> spiritual form, and then God gave me a body to become a human being." We, we are created as humans, but our ultimate goal is as a spiritual being. That would make us like a reincarnation. A reincarnation or what the Mormons believe. The Mormons believe you are a pre-existent spirit that God then puts in a body. And when you die, you now move on to be a, your own God. That's the Mormon doctrine. You're a pre-existent being. <laughs> You get a human body, and when you die, if you've been a good and faithful Mormon, you get to be a god, and you will have your own planet over that you are god over. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Mormons don't have that. They still have, you know, John Smith had the King James Version. Um, the Book of Mormon is its own self. It's not a translation of the Bible. But from what Joseph Smith revealed, that's what their belief is. And they would say that the Book of Mormon is a greater book. Not that they would say, they do say. The Book of Mormon is a greater and more accurate book than the Bible. So the prophet John Smith, prophet John Smith was given this revelation from God that he would write this book that would be even greater than the Bible called the Book of Mormon. Didn't he fall asleep under a tree and have a vision? Yeah, he did. Yeah, and then, the, yeah, yeah, I believe he did. I believe he did. The, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but he was also a pretty bad dude. You know, I mean, he, he just, yeah. he, he got up to a whole lot of nothing. We are digressing. So <laughs> let me let me answer the question. Jesus' ancestry happens because of the human form, because Mary is involved in this. Jesus' ancestry happens because we are promised in the Old Testament that he will be from the root of David, which then goes back through the, the, the patriarch Abraham. Abraham. So that's where <laughs> that lineage comes from. So Jesus is fully human in that he has a lineage. He has a promised lineage, and that is fulfilled. But he also has this inexplicable lineage in which Mary conceives through the Holy Spirit. And isn't the Muslim faith based upon the descendant of the child, the illegitimate child? Of Co correct. Sarah, is it Sarah? Yes. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. That's, and, and that's why they believe in God as Father. I don't know what they... they interpretation of the spirit is but i know the, no, the muslims no, believe that jesus prophet. is a great prophet yeah. not not god well instead of isaac it was the other one Ishmael. 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 yes thank you yes all right so the answer to this is jesus as a son of man has an earthly lineage jesus as a son of god has a spiritual lineage for want of a better word it's not really a lineage because jesus is god but that explains some of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense in all of this. I'm not sure if you're shocked. <laughs> Your mind's just blown. <laughs> so what, what, what happened when Jesus was crucified? We lose the human form. Does the Son no. become the Holy Spirit? No, 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 no. So when Jesus is crucified, he's still human. But, but when he's following his death, following his death, he's still following his death is confusing. He has the body like we will have right. when we are resurrected. So Jesus sometimes is recognizable, sometimes isn't. We are told he just appears in the middle of the room. So he's still a son, and we would consider a son, for instance, in human form, but he's still a son. He he is still. He's the son of man in human form. He's the son of man in a resurrected form because we will have that same body that Je we will have a body like Jesus has, the spiritual body. So, so yeah, maybe the same as he was on earth or looks like. No. no. In heaven, he will be Jesus who is present in creation. He will oh. be God. But somehow scripture says we will experience God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There won't just be one bright light. We will get to know God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? But there will be one God. But we also understand this a lot better than I can explain it right now. That's the beauty of heaven. Is that I will get to fully know God. <clears throat> it's once Jesus ascends that he is no longer uh, in human form. So his spirit being God... He's fully human, fully God. He's fully human spiritual body as we will be resurrected. And he returns back to fully divine form uh, at the ascension. When he was walking around and seeing people before he ascended, maybe it was just like seeing the 
Holy Spirit is the devil. Yeah, yeah. In, in that sense, yes, but in, in the sense that Jesus also fulfills, Jesus is the first example that we know of, of what it will be to be a resurrected being. You won't have a physical body, but there'll be something about you that's very recognizable. So Jesus clearly didn't have physical limitations post-resurrection, right? He was not limited by space or time. Right. Neither will we when we have our spiritual bodies. It, it's some kind of form of recognizable existence because Jesus didn't appear as a frog after he was resurrected. He appeared as a human being. But he was a human being that no longer had the limitations of the physical body, which is exactly what will happen when we are resurrected and we receive our spiritual bodies. Okay, but when you say when we are resurrected, so when we die, we're the body, we're still the body. But yet when we die, our soul goes. Right? You know, but you'll be able to recognize those that died before. Yes. Sherry, and your question is difficult to answer because it's the question of when you die, do you immediately go to heaven no. or no. paradise? No. Or do you kind of be, are you put in a stage of waiting? No. There's scripture passages that indicate both. Mm -hmm. I believe you go to be in paradise mm -hmm. and then when we're resurrected, we're all in heaven. Mm -hmm. Paradise has elements of heaven, but it, is, it doesn't have the new earth and it doesn't have the, the new Jerusalem. Is that the same as the purgatory no. that the Catholics have? Um, no, it's not the same as purgatory because purgatory you're still going to work out your sin. The Bible says God judges based on your spiritual commitment. That's the first judgment. The second judgment is based on your works. Even as Christians, we will be judged on our works. But there's a first judgment that determines whether you're with God or not with God. That could be done. <laughs> How does... <laughs> Hang on to your faith, John. <laughs> Hang on to your faith because that's all you got, brother. Um, so, yeah, remember, the first judgment is not based on works. You, you're, you're getting into God's presence and the first judgment is not based on works. That's the second judgment that comes later. Look, you're good on the first, but you're kind of lame on the second. <laughs> Well, yeah. what happens is you you get you get less spiritual treasures. Don't know what that translates into. I don't care if I get a prize. I just want to get there. You just want to get there, yes. Maybe that's the different rooms. Yeah. Different houses or whatever. Mm -hmm. I remember when you did that study mm -hmm. on the different levels of. of yeah, but on, on on Paul's seeing the levels of heaven. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, but that. Yeah. That could mean that he saw the levels of heaven as in the the sky, the 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 the, the place where the moon hangs out, and where heaven is, where God hangs out. But nonetheless, it does say that you know, like when he was on the cross, he told the guy, you know, I'll be with you, you know. Today, today. this day, you will yeah. be with me. So as soon as you're gone, he's with you. Which is the verse that I kind of cling to, believing yeah. that when you die, he's there. Mm -hmm. It's you and God. We digress. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, the son of God genealogy makes no sense. The son of man genealogy goes, oh, okay. If Jesus is just divine, then the genealogy thing's out the window. Fully human? Ah, oh, okay. Makes more sense. All right. I hope I answered the question. Would somebody close us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we were able to come and we can learn more. I know sometimes it's really a hard thing to put our mind around mm. as to how things are with you. I know um, we have trouble with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't keep us from believing that there is and we still believe in you. But it is hard to really grasp it. But we thank you, Lord, that Pastor Wayne's able to put out 
took his time to help us to understand more about the Bible and what it's telling us to know so we can know more about what to look forward to. Dear Lord, just be with each and every one of us and, and uh, we have a safe trip home and that uh, we can come back next week and learn some more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.